Welcome everyone, I'm Ann Petrick, Senior Director of Research at Vistage. I'm happy to host this latest webinar in our Peak Performer webinar series. The series is designed to support your leadership climb by bringing the most trusted experts to the Vistage community who provide exceptional insight and best practices to help you navigate new challenges and possibilities. Today's focus is on managing talent as we spring from the depths of the pandemic. Joining me today is Vistage Chief Research Officer, Joe Galvin, to discuss the big decisions for CEOs, how to hybrid. Vistage speaker, Dr. Gleb Sapersky, also joins us to share best practices for planning your return to the office with insights that you can benchmark yourself against. Please note, we will be sending out a link to the recording and slides in 24 hours. Now we'll turn it over to you, Joe, to get us started. Thank you, Ann, and welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar, Talent Wars 2.0, The New Battlefield. Uh, our CEO community and leaders are facing a series of really big decisions, uh, but to talk about big decisions is to put it in context of the new battlefield. It was March of 1918, the last year of World War I, when the Germans, following the collapse of Russia in the fall of 1917, were able to move 56 fresh divisions to the Western Front and then attack the exhausted British and French lines. While the physical battlefield was the same from the guns of August of 1914, the practical battlefield had radically changed. The industrialization of war had brought significant improvements to the machine gun and to artillery. And the introduction of new weapons uh, like the airplane, uh, like the tank and chemical weapons had made this an entirely new battlefield. Three men were tasked with making those big decisions on that new battlefield. One of them on the right, General John Blackjack Pershing, faced a set of decisions no one had ever faced before. No one had ever led an American army on the European continent to war. The British, the French, and the Germans had been fighting each other for centuries, but no American force had ever been thrust into this situation, let alone one when the Germans were attacking dramatically. Well, today's leaders, face some big decisions. It's not the life and death that we saw, and we know how those decisions played out as the war ended in November of that year. But today's CEOs are facing critical decisions that will determine the fate and the fortune of their business. And that's what we're here to discuss today. That is one, how to compete on this new battlefield of the talent wars. We were in a talent war before the pandemic. Now, 16, 18 months later, we're in an entirely different battlefield. And two new decisions, decisions that no CEO has ever had to make before. One is how to return to work. At no point in our lifetimes have we seen a complete shutdown and return to work in a very narrow window, let alone this big decision now of how to hybrid and what that means. And that's what Vistage Research is here for, is that we focus on doing the research, providing the data, and bringing in the expert perspectives to help you, our members, make great decisions. Decisions on the issues, topics of business optimization and leadership enhancement. We use our Vistage decision model as a lens to focus on those decisions. First at the core is the leader and the decisions you make as a leader and how you show up every day. Next is leadership, which are the processes, the practices, the strategies of leading, and of course, the areas of business that you're looking to optimize. I'm lucky today to have two folks helping me with this. One is Ann Peter, who you met earlier. Uh, Ann has done the lion's share of the work behind our brand new employee development report, and she also does the data work, and she's going to share some insights on both. And then joining us is Vistage speaker and my good friend, Dr. Gleb Sapersky. He's going to take us through the work that he has done uh, on creating this new hybrid workforce. And again, given no one's ever done this before, there's, there's no real data, there's no books, uh, he's going to provide a real expert perspective on the best practices for that. Uh, but first, let's set the stage for this talent war and these big decisions that we're all facing. Our CEO Confidence Index is something we've been doing since 2003. We just closed this survey on Monday, June 14. So this data is very fresh. And you can see uh, we saw another jump from Q1 to 108.8. That is the ninth highest number we've had in the history of this survey. It hit, two, it hit 110 in 28 for Q1 of 2018 following the, the tax reform package. And then seven consecutive quarters from 2003 to 2005 uh, after the dot-com bubble crash. So it's clear we're seeing tremendous energy and confidence driving uh, our CEO's mindset. If we get inside of that a little bit, we can look at the components. One on the economy, we see uh, in terms of the recent economy, and again, this is comparing to Q1, 40%, we see a real surge in confidence about where the current economy is. While the future looks uh, maybe not as bright as it did, still at 54%, we're viewing the look ahead from a much higher perch than where we were in Q1. 
If we look at prospects, we see a little bit of movement, maybe not significant in terms of revenues and profits, but still 78% are expecting increased revenues and 57% increased profits. What's driving all this, of course, are the expansion plans. We now see 53% of our community increasing their investments in the year ahead, up nine points from Q1. And now 71%, up from 66%, are now increasing their headcount. Now, clearly, part of that headcount increase is driving those investments. But it's clear there's a high confidence in our community. And they're making the big bets in terms of their investments and hiring people to be able to capitalize on this growth wave. What's driving all this? Well, of course, it's the vaccine. Since the peak in, in mid-January of this year, we've seen the data just fall down in terms of, in terms of number of cases, uh, number of folks hospitalized, and, and the number of deaths we see on a daily basis. The vaccines are making a radical impact across the country. Different levels in different parts of the country, but it's clear it's the vaccines that is driving this return to work, return to life, and with it, a robust economy that is absolutely surging at this point. It leads to major decisions. We talk about CEOs are in the business of making decisions. We ask this decision every year in December. And I, and I put this out here because even before uh, we came into the surge, hiring, recruiting, and sourcing was a top decision our leaders were facing coming into 2021. And look just behind it, performance management. When we connect this to our categories of, of our decision model, we can see that the talent was a top issue. I just point out right behind that, customers. You see product pricing, market development, sales, marketing. This is all part of reigniting the growth engine as we see our leaders gearing up to take advantage of this return to spend as consumers come back to the market and the pent up demand across the board is driving our economy to levels, uh, levels of growth that are quite frankly, we haven't seen in our lifetime. Well, let's get behind the hiring, recruiting and sourcing because I thought this was a fascinating question. And this again came from our Q2 survey. We asked which type of employees are you struggling to find? And behind it, we also asked an open-ended question about what does that mean and what are you doing about it? First, we see hourly frontline workers. And this is clearly an area, uh, again, in the manufacturing, in construction, in some of the services businesses, that we see a real competition here. And, and we saw some comments on this, uh, specifically about uh, that the government subsidy programs are keeping people from working. They're making more on government subsidies than they are on uh, going to work. And that might be true at the lower end, but that's gonna go away in the fall and we'll, we'll see if in fact that's true. What's at, what, and other factors driving this, because that's not the only thing is one, we've got 2 million women that are out of the workforce. Why? Because schools are closed. The childcare industry has collapsed. Uh, that too will play out and we'll see some recovery there as it comes to the fall. We're seeing increased competition. Again, if you do a, a bell curve of humans, those higher quality hourly workers are able to compete for higher hourly wages. We see companies of all types raising that hourly rate from the, from the minimum to 14, 15, $20 an hour. Amazon alone hired 350,000 workers between July and October of last year. So competition is driving higher hourly rates that people are getting to. And we're also seeing a migration of workers, those high quality hourly workers, those that show up every day, work hard when they're there and can pass a drug test. They're able to enter programs and move up to the skilled workers level. Uh, there was a story in the New York Times about a, a gentleman who had been a nightclub bouncer and worked the 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. shift, uh, was, had applied to IBM, didn't get called back, got a call back. IBM put him in a program taught him how to be a computer maintenance technician. He's now a skilled worker and he sees a career going forward, repairing and, and dealing with computers. So we see this migration of the higher quality hourly workers into the skilled workers. And let's admit, there's a huge shortage of skilled workers. We do not have enough welders. We do not have enough truck drivers. We do not have enough trained and skilled carpenters. This demand for skilled workers with the collapse of the trades, uh, trade schools and in high schools has led, and we'll see in a minute, 19% uh, of our members are investing in and building apprentice programs, teaching those high quality hourly workers how to become skilled. And then of course, there's a professional staff. Every business has got finance, they have uh, HR, they have legal, they have operations, they have sales and marketing. Everyone's looking for this. And it's interesting if you look at this, then management and leadership, it's almost an inverse pyramid of the organizational chart. So everybody's looking for everybody at every level is the message behind that which puts tremendous pressure on our talent management strategies. And this is from our Q1 uh, survey where we asked to rate the components of the talent management strategy. 
And we see at the top of the list, retaining existing talent. Retention of talent is the single most important issue that you can face right now with talent management. You simply can't afford to lose people when you're looking for people. And know that everybody's looking for people. Even those that aren't increasing headcount have to be looking for people because they're losing people. Creating a strong culture is next. A culture was a huge element of the talent wars prior to COVID. What's unique about talent, it's the only unique attribute of your business. I can, I can copy your product. I can reverse engineer your processes. Uh, I can take your employees. I can steal your customers. I cannot replicate your talent because your talent or your, your culture because your culture is unique to you. And we know with our millennials uh, and our Gen Zs, they're looking for something more than just a job. They want to be part of something. And then of course, attracting qualified talent because everybody's looking for talent. Those are those top three priorities. And that creates this new battlefield of the Talent Wars 2.0. Retention is and was a foundation of a strategy, right? You can't afford to lose people while you're hiring people. But we know that headhunters are hunting heads. They're extremely aggressive going after people uh, in organizations. The counter to that and the part of the new battlefield, and this is from a Microsoft study uh, that came out in March, an employee side study that found that 41% of employees are considering changing jobs. There is a massive personal recalibration of priorities and purpose that workers are going through. As they now, as we now emerge from this pandemic and, and the lockdowns and all that meant to each of us in our, in our own unique ways, many people are reconsidering what they want and what that means. And that's creating this, this sense of movement, this sense of almost a worker's revolt as people reconsider what's important to them and what matters. And that puts a whole new spin on this new battlefield of the Talent Wars 2.0. We saw the shift earlier uh, from hiring to recruiting as part of the prior talent management roles. You're not putting out a, uh, hang on a sign and say, we're gonna hire. Rather, what you're doing is you're recruiting people. The change now is flexibility is the new black. Culture, employee development, but now flexibility is what matters. Uh, we said in, in April of last year, when we put out a piece that said we saw 15 years of behavior change in 30 days. And we said that we're, the genie was out of the bottle on the work from home phenomenon. And now we're seeing that come out as flexibility becomes a new element that we've never had to deal with in the talent wars battlefield. And we're also seeing that uh, people are recalibrating, recalculating how they recruit, virtual recruiting, depending upon your workplace model. Uh, are you looking for the best person in town? or the best person and what that means. Uh, and this, the counter to that is that now your employees have choices. They can find a fully remote job. They can find a job that allows them to come in on a, on a hybrid basis. So the battlefield for talent wars has changed radically. And those organizations that keep up are more likely to do best. So how do you compete? Well, there's a list that you compete. What is the job? What is, uh, traditionally it's always been, what's the job and what's the career direct? career trajectory, but now we see also company growth. Many companies struggle, especially in the small and mid-sized business, struggle to come out of this, uh, struggle during the pandemic and struggle to come out. Headhunters are targeting those, those opportunities and coming after that. Next is compensation. Salary is a big component. And you'll see in a minute a chart that shows uh, that 66% of CEOs are raising salaries to respond to that. But there's other areas you can do this too. Um, we asked this question about if hiring is more difficult, what do you do in response? And there you see it. 66% are boosting strategies. We just talked about refining recruiting strategies. We're gonna talk in a minute about developing uh, existing workforce, working remotely. But look, offering hiring bonuses at 26%. Unfortunately, down those 22% are slowing or delaying growth. And look, 19% are looking for partners or creating apprentice and internship programs, trying to teach those high quality hourly workers give them the skills to become a skilled worker and allowing them to migrate up uh, that chain uh, of jobs and, and creating better lives for themselves and their families. Uh, but we can see that boosting wages, you gotta throw money at it. That's part of the, part of the plan, right? There's other areas too. Um, and I'm gonna point you to a, lot, a series of assets that you can get, they're all available at the Vistage Research Center. Uh, but we did, a, uh, we did a webinar back in May with our friends from UBS, where we talked about the value of, of employee stock ownership programs not just as an effective exit vehicle for owners, but as a way to drive employee engagement and culture. And oh, by the way, retention. If your employees feel like they're owners or they're part of the company, if they've got a vested interest in being part of it, they're less likely to answer the phone. 
And let's face it, you win the retention battle before it is even fought. Before the employee picks up the phone to answer a call or picks up the phone to proactively dial, that's when you have to win. Because once they cross that threshold, they're vulnerable. We had another great webinar in June from our friends at Insperity talking about a performance incentives and going through uh, the various options that are available uh, that drive engagement and keep employees attached. And I invite you to download and look at, and look at both of these sessions. Uh, next up is benefits. And benefits has always been an important aspect, something we competed on. Uh, you know, free lunch, wellness, having a health club. Healthcare has become really important. I think we all appreciated that as we went through uh, the pandemic. But what's emerged as being critically important is employee development. Uh, employee development is a huge asset. And we see that those, uh, you know, I think of the old, uh, the old uh, timeless conversation of the CFO uh, who said to the CEO, what if we train them and they leave? And the CEO says, what if we don't train them and they stay? Employee development is critical. And this is where I'd like to bring in, bring in Ann Petrie. Ann did the lion's share of the work uh, behind our most recent uh, research report on employee development as a competitive advantage for recruiting and training. So Ann, uh, help us out here, would you please? Absolutely. So Joe, just as you shared the fact, uh, the top decisions that our members were making in 2021, we also asked about top investments. And I want you to think about the areas you're investing in. And what we found is that while technology continues to be a top investment, that the second investment for 2021 was matched our top decision, hiring, recruiting, and sourcing, investing in the talent. But you also see here employee development is number five, and that was even higher last year. So there's a lot of investment in employee development, some recognition that those programs are significant. And that was really the foundation of our latest report, uh, that employee development, the CEO's competitive advantage, really to dig into the different areas that you can impact in your business, starting with retention and the ability to drive that loyalty and protect revenue. Joe talked a little bit about the significance of retention and how maintaining that strong base of employees is so important. But we also found that there's a connection between revenue and retention. We asked these questions looking back across the pandemic. We asked questions about retention rates and how they were moving as well as revenue impact. And we found those CEOs that reported having increased retention rates were actually more likely to have stable or increasing revenues compared to those that had decreasing retention rates. So your ability to fulfill, to scale, to grow is based on retention. And this is proof of that as well. And the next layer of the report digs into acquisition and how you can gain a competitive advantage. Employees really want to see proof of the future. And you think about uh, how you can differentiate your company and what your candidates are looking for, outlining a clear development program, career pathing, how you are going to invest in them is a demonstration of, of their how you're investing in their future. So that's another critical area to think about. And we see that in that competitive advantage, when we ask the question about hiring, Joe talked about boosting wages and hiring bonuses and we're investing money in compensation, but also in developing the existing workforce. And this is something that's been rising to the top as a strategy to in, in challenges hiring. And part of that is the competitive advantage, but some of that is improving productivity. So when you're trying to make do with what you have, if you're having challenges hiring, investing in the productivity and improving the performance of the people you have today is very significant, it helps you improve that capacity and capability to be able to achieve and scale and grow in ways that you can without hiring or expanding the workforce. And we asked about the different components of employee development and find that a lot of the investments take place on the front end of the employee life cycle. So general onboarding and jobs, specific skills training, really getting new hires up to speed, because we know that the, the, law, the cost of lost productivity is significant, especially when you're hiring or expanding. So a lot of the investment is taking place there. But I would say that one of the blind spots and one area to consider is really if you look later down the employee life cycle, the leadership development program and soft skills training, that's significant as well. Because we know that employees don't leave bad companies, they leave bad managers. So when you think about an investment in leadership development, and certainly everyone should have the opportunity um, to, with, to have their leadership skills developed. We talked about 
the expert perspective here from Jeremy Kubasek that's in our report. He shares that leadership is not just for managers, but everyone has the opportunity to demonstrate leadership in their roles and should have the opportunity to have those skills developed. But when you invest in developing the leadership skills of your managers, that's an investment of retention. Not only are you investing in those managers, the, the future of your organization, but you're investing in the employee experience as well. Everyone that reports to those managers has the opportunity to be the beneficiary of the leadership skills that they have developed. So next we'll talk, uh, turn it back to Joe so you can talk about culture. Thank you, Ann. Um, culture is and was a critical component uh, we talked about this before, but culture is what people want to be a part of. It's how you can truly differentiate and compete for talent based on what you are and what you're about. Um, culture, you need to think of it as your gravity. You know, you don't see gravity, but you feel it with every step you take. And the same is true for the culture of your organization. It has this magnetic capability to hold your good employees. It repels and rejects the bad, both in terms of, of people you're, you're considering to employ, maybe employees that change. But most importantly, it is a gravity that attracts people to your business and to your organization. We published our research report on creating a conscious culture in the fall of 2019. Our concept was you need to create the culture you want because if you don't, you'll get the culture you deserve. Anytime you put a group of humans together, a culture will emerge naturally. As a leader, you have to create that culture that you want. We think a culture is a component of a variety of elements. It starts by being fused by the trust that people have based on consistent behaviors. Uh, it's defined by those elements, the values you, you embrace, the language that you use, the way you communicate, the behaviors you exhibit, and the rituals you observe. It's bound by the mission and vision of the business, but at the core, the power, it's powered by purpose. What is the purpose of your organization? Again, I invite you to download the report or, or listen to the webinar we did where we expand and grow in our concept of culture because it truly is a competitive differentiator and advantage. Uh, another interesting point, and this is uh, this has emerged, is diversity. Uh, we asked this question in December of 2019, and then again in 2020, along with a series of other questions. But diversity and inclusion is a key part of our talent development strategies. And look, the agree strongly agree grew by 13 points year over year and the disagree strongly disagree fell by 12 points. So clearly as we go forward, not just into this year, but into the, the next decade and, and beyond, diversity and inclusion uh, is a key part of, uh, of your talent management strategy, but also it's, it's gonna be a, a huge factor in, in who and how you're able to attract people. Which leads us to our last element and the brand new element, which is flexibility. Uh, and we think of flexibility is, is, is what do you offer in terms of flexibility? Is it office-based, which is the traditional Monday, Friday, nine to five environment? Work from home, meaning you are physically capable of getting to the office on any given day or fully remote. I happen to be a fully remote employee. I live in Connecticut and the Vistage corporate offices are in San Diego. It's this flexibility that has become really important and has changed the dynamics and leads to this first big decision, which is, returning to work. Every leader is facing this decision now of when and how to return to work. California and New York have just both, been, both fully opened up. Some states have been open for a long time. Others will be following based upon their own individual data. But CEOs are going to invite, then request, and then require employees return to the workplace. Now, I think it was uh, the CEO of, of Morgan Stanley in uh, New York City who said he fully expects every employee to be back in the New York office uh, after Labor Day. And he said, those that aren't, we'll have a separate conversation. And he moved from the invite to require pretty quickly. What does that mean from a leadership standpoint? And what does it mean to the employees as they return to the workplace? And this is the first big decision no one's ever had to make before. We've never shut down the economy and then turned it back on within 15 months and had the ability to move our knowledge workers home and now bring them back. Uh, I want to turn to Ann uh, again to go through the data because we asked a series of questions on this. So Ann, uh, can you pick this up and walk us through these data charts? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the top things to think about when you're bringing people back to the office is what kind of safety is there? Obviously, within each state, each community, there's different levels of vaccination rates. And Joe already talked about the fact that the vaccine distribution and the, the lessening or disappearing of restrictions is what's enabling us to come back to the office. But we wanted to understand how small and mid-sized businesses were approaching vaccinations. That's a 
key part of keeping the workplace safe for both customers and employees. We find that for the most part, vaccines are a personal decision. Very small percentage requiring that employees are vaccinated, likely due to their, their work environment and how they're engaging potentially with their customers. Um, but for the most part, re recommending but not requiring, and some are not even requesting vaccine information at all. So that seems to be a very personal decision. And that's something that you need to consider for your business, for your employees and your customers, and your personal preference. Certainly the 3% that are requiring, it's perfectly legal to be able to do that. And there's a lot of considerations around commu um, communicating that to the workforce, as well as the impacts around retention. But then when we look at workplace safety on another level um, and masking policies, this was something that was in place. And you can see between April and June with CDC basically removing mask requirements or the mask recommendations, uh, we see that there's a big shift in how masks are required for businesses. And now 59% saying masks are not required. Now, certainly that's up to an individual's uh, point of view. Uh, masks have not been required in my state. I'm fully vaccinated, but I still choose when I go out with my daughter to wear a mask. That's personal preference. But what we're seeing is that big shift of masks not being required. But think about the fact of creating a workplace that feels safe, not just physically, but the psychological and emotional safety that some of these policies might have in terms of vaccines, um, how you recommend that, how you promote that, and your masking policies as well. Now that's if you're returning to the workplace. And so we wanted to understand also the workforce model. Where are we going forward for the balance of 2021 and then beyond? And we find that whatever you're doing through the balance of 2021 is going to be the permanent model. And surprisingly, just 3% are saying their entire workforce is fully remote. And as Joe said, likely this is uh, professional services, knowledge workers that have that ability and maybe already had that ability. 70% are some level of hybrid and over a quarter, 27% fully on site. So we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into that hybrid mix. So that 70%, what did that actually look like? So of those who report a mix of that 70% of hybrid for 2021, actually six in 10 of their employees will be on site. So the hybrid mix isn't everybody works only certain times. It's 60% are fully on site, 14% fully remote, and uh, a lot of that, and then the 20, just a quarter is hybrid. So when we talk about how to hybrid, it's an interesting combination of fully on site, fully remote, and then managing the scheduling and creative time of those people who are both in the office and fully remote. Thanks, Anna. Really, you know, you look at manufacturing, you look at construction, you look at there are some jobs, you have to be on site to do it. That's just a non-negotiable. Uh, but as you see this, this evolution, the professional, the, the professional staff, the knowledge workers, um, this hybrid decision and how to hybrid is really become the big decision. Uh, again, it's a decision no one's ever had to make before. Uh, we've never been in this position before. We started, we've been talking about this for a while, but it's really become critical to determining how to hybrid. And we're seeing as CEOs go through this process and make this decision, many of them are making it based on what they're comfortable with. I'm comfortable with uh, bringing everybody back because I like to see everybody in the office. But maybe employees don't think that way. Uh, there is this report from Microsoft that came out in late March. It was an employee side. Our data is all about what our CEO community says. But this is an employee side survey. It said 41% of employees are considering changing employers in the year ahead. This is part of this personal recalibration. 46 are likely to move because they can now work remotely. Uh, in Dr. Gleb's report, which I highly recommend, he summarizes five other employee side reports that all seem to suggest between 41 and 47% of employees are considering changing in the year ahead. And this is really important to understand because as CEOs make decisions without data, therefore relying more on their, their instincts, um, employees are going to make their own decision as well. Because uh, as we said, the big decision about returning to work, uh, once you make that decision, we now go to something I call the, the 22 shuffle, which says that CEOs are going to make their decision on what their workplace model is going to be. And then employers are going to decide their workplace preference. And the shuffle will start. In this market, in this environment, this tug of war uh, between employees and employer, the employees have the power. Why? Because 71% of people are hiring, because they can find a workplace that's consistent with how they want to work. And what will happen over the next 12 to 18 months, 
I don't know that 41 to 47% are going to change. Well, we won't know until the end what those numbers are. But clearly, employees are going to find a workplace consistent with how they want to work. And if you've had a long commute, if you've gotten comfortable uh, having dinner with the family, they're going to look for those options and they exist. And recruiters will prey on that. And that's why this is such a big decision. This is why it's so important to understand the dynamics of how to hybrid, right? You know, again, it's this, this continuum of MF95. Now that's not a new gang. Uh, that's Monday to Friday, nine to five, the traditional workplace that we left in March and April of last year to this hybrid environment where people can get to the office if they, if they choose and they're remote. We know there are some things that work better face-to-face, -face, collaboration, innovation, problem solving, uh, team building, all the cultural events, right? And there's other tasks individually that, uh, that work better. If you're just doing your job, you can, you can do it alone. Uh, my daughter uh, joined a tech company in June of last year had never been to the office, had only met her coworkers uh, in the little 16 by nine boxes of Zoom. Well, yesterday she went in office for the first time and she had to go to the receptionist and say, hi, where's my office? Where's my, where's my floor? Uh, and her comment to me last night was, you know, going to the office was great. I need to be connected to people to meet these people in person who I'd seen and recognized from Zoom, but I'm not going to the office unless I have a purpose and I've got meetings with people. Otherwise I can do my job remotely. And I think that's the continuum you're going to see. And that dynamic, what's interesting about this is that when we, when everybody broke to work from home, we were grateful we could keep working. But now we have to separate where we work from when we work. And this concept of creating core hours, when everyone can be together, uh, when you can reasonably expect, whether you're in the office or, or working from home, uh, that people will respond at a reasonable time and you can reasonably assume to, to, to schedule meetings. So we kind of just jumped into it, but understanding the difference between where you work and when you work, those are separate questions we need to answer and they're part of this big decision. Next is the realization that culture is both a victim and a beneficiary of this. Uh, maintaining a culture is hard. It's hard in the traditional environment. It's even harder in a remote environment. Why? Because we, we discussed this, culture is your gravity. And, and even though the moon uh, is a remote to earth, uh, it is still connected to us because of gravity. And as I said, culture is the only unique attribute of your business. We'll have to learn and develop and build totally new skills about how to use our culture for those remote and those hybrid workers to ensure they feel that emotional connection to the business and the people that they work with. And then of course, um, work from home is about performance management. You know, we hear the comment and some of the comments, I don't trust people to work from home. Well, if you don't trust them to work from home, do you trust them to work in the office? You know, physical attendance is not productive work necessarily. It is an industrial age boomer mentality that says, I must see people in the office. Uh, you must check in at nine and check out at five. Uh, and that's what bosses want. Uh, a lot of bosses are very comfortable with that environment because they can walk around and, and see people and pat them on the head where employees feel differently about this. We mentioned earlier the 15 years of behavior change in just 30 days. That happens on both sides of the equation with both bosses uh, and it also happened with, uh, with employees. So as you think about this big decision about how to, how to hybrid, we need to understand the dynamics of this worker revolt that's going on. The, the 41 to 47% who are considering changing jobs based upon what that new workplace model would be. You know, if you go back to the industrial revolution, workers could, could would and did collectively strike for better workplace conditions, safety, pay, breaks, hours. Well, today's workers, um, you know, they may not have a vote collectively, but they do have the ability to vote individually. And that's why this concept of the 22 shuffle will come into play. As you make decisions about how you're going to hybrid uh, and what that workplace model is gonna be and what that level of flexibility is going to be, once that's laid down, then your workforce will determine how they wanna do this. I've heard, I've heard stories, especially in the financial industry, of, of 15, 10, 15, 20 year folks who've been, who've been on that horse and, and it's been, they've been riding hard and, and now they're making a decision, do I wanna get back on that horse? And we're seeing people transition again. I believe there is a, a personal recalibration of priorities and purpose that every worker and every leader is going through based upon this incredibly unique and hopefully once in a lifetime experience of the last 15 months. And that's gonna dramatically change the workplace going forward. We've said many times there is no going back. 
You're not going to repair what you had because that's going to build, fix it for a prior state. We are in a completely new reality. And that new reality is driven by all that we've experienced both personally and professionally over the course of this pandemic. And a big part of that is this hybrid work environment, the work from home uh, experience that everyone's had and many are unwilling to give up. So as I said, while employees don't necessarily have a vote, they do have a voice and they will express their voice if you ask them uh, and they will vote individually based on whether they choose to say, or as I said, they'll cross that threshold and either answer the phone or pick up the phone and go find a job that is more consistent with their priorities and their purpose. So we ask this question, I do this as a, as a prelude to bring Dr. Gleb into the discussion. We ask, the, we ask our CEOs, are you, are you planning to ask your people uh, about what their preference are? And we found that 44% were, another 13% are planning to, but 39% are saying, no, I'm not gonna ask. Um, and I think that's interesting to understand because um, in this economic wave that we're all riding and we just saw that, you know, we're gonna see GDP over 6% for this year. The bigger the wave, the stronger the undertow. And the undertow for this wave is this question right here, is how to hybrid, what that workplace model is going to be and how your employees are going to react to the decision that you made. And that's why I'd now like to introduce my friend, Dr. Gleb Sapersky. Uh, Gleb is CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts. I've referenced his white paper a couple times. Uh, he will give you and, and he'll give you directions and share with you how to find it. I highly recommend it. Uh, but Gleb, thank you for, for being a Vistage speaker and thank you for sharing your expertise with us now. So please, Gleb, go ahead. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Joe. Really appreciate it. So let's talk about how to hybrid. That's what the goal is. How do you do hybrid? And Joe mentioned some surveys. And since I wrote that white paper, a couple more surveys came out. So there are eight major independent surveys from venues like Microsoft, Slack, Harvard Business School, uh, SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management, which show that 75 to 85% of workers want substantial remote work. They want either a combination of hybrid or fully remote work. Of those, of all workers, 25 to 40% want full-time remote work. By the way, this is only people who can work remotely, of course. We're talking about that 53, 54% of the American workforce who can work remotely. We're not talking about the people in manufacturing and construction who can't. This is about who can work remotely. 75 to 85% want hybrid or fully remote work. 25 to 40 want fully remote work. And 40 to 55% would leave their job if forced to come in full time. That is a problem. And that is a serious issue for leaders who want to make them full, come in full time. And they're ready to give up substantial benefits, an average of 8% of their salary for substantial remote work. So that will be an advantage for the so many of you, 71% who are recruiting folks. You can recruit them at lower pay if you give them substantial remote work, maybe even full time remote work or a substantial amount of hybrid. So you have to think about that idea that people are our greatest resource. You've heard that phrase, you probably said that phrase, but are people who are saying this phrase, are leaders truly living by that principle if they're doing what Joe is saying of going with what they're comfortable, which many people just do want to see employees in the office, they feel comfortable with that. And I've helped 12 companies transition from their pandemic model to the post-pandemic model. The large majority of them have chosen to do some small amount of full-time remote work, but they're all doing hybrid. So large majority of folks in those companies are hybrid, something like 60 to 70%. And of course, the ones who have to be in the workplace are in the workplace, like a major restaurant chain. But we're talking about people who can do fully remote work. Uh, the vast majority of those folks who I helped, 70 to 80% of them are hybrid, but there are 10 to 30% of them who are fully remote. So you want to be thinking about this because leaders feel comfortable with in-office culture and they want to turn back the clock to January 2020, but that's not a good idea. This tug of war is something that employees will win right now and in the foreseeable future because there are so many opportunities for them. And there are many companies that are making really bad decisions. You could see that Amazon, Apple, and Google, you don't want to follow their bad example. You know, tech companies are supposedly leading the way to full remote work. Not true. Amazon, Apple, and Google wanted their employees to return full-time nine to five. On May 5th, Google backtracked on forcing all employees to return to the office 
because they had so many employees leaving and revolting and resisting internally to this. On June 10th, so just about a week ago, Amazon similarly backtracked saying, okay, we're not gonna force everyone to return back to the office Monday through Friday, nine to five. And Apple also tried to do this. It's experiencing staff revolt resignations right now. I suspect they will backtrack as well. And so you wanna be not following the example of these companies. That's a bad idea. You, the return to full-time office work is going to be really problematic if you're forcing people to return who can work from home. For retention, huge issue. For recruitment, 71% of you are recruiting folks. For their morale, I mean, do you really want them to stay but be kind of miserable in the job? Productivity. Productivity, as Joe said, lots of stuff is much better done at home. Individual work, project work, those administrative tasks, collaborative tasks are better done in the office, most of them. The work-life balance, people report that they want much more work-life balance and that the staying at home, a substantial hybrid or fully remote work is much better for them. And then mental health and well-being goes into the same area. So all of that combines into saying that returning to full-time office work is going to be seriously problematic for your bottom line. You don't want to go there. So what you want to do is instead go to a team-led hybrid model. And it's very surprising that only 44% of Vistage members surveyed their employees. Some have plans to do so, but so far 44% were in the middle of 2021 and only 44% of them surveyed their employees. That's a problem. Your people don't want to hear, leaders may not want to hear answers that are uncomfortable for them, are unpleasant for them, but if you don't listen to your employees, that's going to be a serious problem. The companies that I helped, you had a number of people, I found a number of people were resistant to getting these surveys done because they didn't want to hear their employees telling them information that they didn't want to know. And when they actually encouraged them and they did the surveys, they found the results which were pretty similar to the major public survey that lots of people really want to do fully remote work or at least hybrid work and that's something that they weren't happy about, but they had to take that into consideration because the employees have so many opportunities to go. So you want to go toward a team-led hybrid model. What that means is that you as leaders set broad parameters. This is the best practice. You want to set broad parameters for what people do. For example, getting most workers in the office one to three days a, a, a week, and then a minority of workers, those who can successfully do their job remotely, those whose team leaders are okay with them working remotely, allow them to do fully remote work. That's again, 10 to 30% of folks, of their employees, of those who can do their work remotely. Most workers are gonna be in the office one to three days a week. By the way, when I say do remotely, I mean people will still come into the office once a quarter for a team building retreat to maintain that culture that Joe was highlighting, which is incredibly important. And you want to maintain that culture so that at least once a quarter to come in for a team building retreat, that works well. And then let team leaders decide, those lower level supervisors who lead the rank and file teams, let them decide what works best for their team because each team is going to be different. So let them decide, don't kind of just tell everyone what to do. Then you want to reshape your office space. Based on that information, the next steps will be reshaping your office space. You'll get information from team leaders and what they decide. And then you want to decrease your real estate footprint and office services accordingly. So that's going to be something that will save you a lot of money if you decrease your real estate footprint and office space. If you, let's say you have people coming in an average of two days a week. Now, probably something like 10 to 30% of your real estate is going to be necessary for you for various administrative tasks and so on. And then the rest of your real estate, so let's say 80% of your real estate will be based on occupancy. If you have people coming in two days a week, then you have 40% of the occupancy that you did before the pandemic. And you can let go of the rest of the 60% uh, that was there before. That'll be really something that will help you cut costs. And of course, services, janitor, security, all of that, various expenses associated with products, commercial printers, and so on. You want to change your office space to be mostly collaborative. This is really important. People who do hybrid, they don't realize all the things that are necessary to do. You cut real estate, that's obvious, but you want to reshape your office space because what we, we talk about, we talked about that the collaborative tasks are the ones that are going to be done in the office. The individual tasks are the ones that folks can do at home. Like Joe's daughter is going to do her individual tasks at home. 
your employees are going to do their individual project tasks, administrative tasks at home. That's their most productive environment. When you look at the research on productivity, the most productive environment for those sorts of tasks is overwhelmingly at home. In the office, collaborative tasks, brainstorming, team building, all of those sorts of things, mentoring, of course, that's better done in the office. So you want to reshape your office space to be mostly collaborative. That means doing things like hot desking, floating desks, maybe assigning a couple of desks to each team and having something like, and that should be one third of your real estate and something, something like two thirds of your real estate collaborative. So collaborative desks and so on, off video conference rooms, lounges and so on. Then you want to revise your performance evaluation. You want to change it, and Joe mentioned this a little bit. You want to change it from time spent working in person to employee productivity. So that's what you want to be focusing on. Employee productivity, tasks accomplished, deliverables delivered. That's what you want to be focusing on, both individual tasks and collaborative ones. And you want to go from annual performance evaluations to weekly report evaluations and check-in meetings. That's what will be necessary for effective task evaluations because you'll be evaluating them on everyday activities that they're performing. That needs to be a weekly process where they're sending in a little report on what they did. You are, or their team leader is evaluating them every week and it's having a meeting every week on doing what's right. So you wanna change your performance evaluation to do hybrid effectively. Then you want to adapt your culture. Joe talked about the culture, and this is something that you really need to shift and adapt for that hybrid environment. Digital co-working when you're not in the office. It means having at least an hour each day when people call in, the whole team co-works together with your microphones off, video on or off, and your speakers on. And so you can chat, chat at the beginning about what you plan to work on. And then during the working, if you have questions, if the employees have questions, they can ask each other. And that's going to be very helpful. That's been shown to be very helpful for employees. Virtual mentor, you want to assign your employees a virtual mentor from outside their team. That one of the problems with hybrid is that they don't get to know other people in the company. They don't get as much mentorship. So you want to get other people from the company who aren't in their team to be a virtual mentor for them. You want to also address diversity inclusion concerns. There are lots of issues with diversity inclusion that you want to make sure are addressed, which includes digital discrimination, which has been an issue throughout the pandemic, and interruptions in privilege, where especially those who are have minority status, women and so on, are more typically interrupted in meetings, virtual meetings. So you want to make sure to address that. Then you want to provide training, upskill your employees. That is very important. We talked about leadership development and other sorts of development, professional development that's specific to the hybrid workplace. So for effective hybrid work, you need to teach people what they need to do at home and in the office, what to do at home, those individual tasks, project tasks, what to focus on in the office, those collaborative tasks, because they haven't done hybrid before. They don't know how to do it. You don't know how to do it. You want to teach them how to do it. You want to make sure that you have experienced professional trainers who teach them what to do at home and what to focus on in the office. And as part of that, you want to teach them effective virtual communication and effective virtual collaboration. That's going to be especially important when some people are having a video conference, some people are hybrid, some people are coming in from home, some people are in the office. Those things are difficult to do. You need to teach them how to do this effectively. So those are the best practices that I want to share with you. And then you can get some free additional resources that Joe mentioned for me, the white paper on returning to the office, benchmarking to best practices, then a, best, a free copy of my best-selling book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. And then a free coaching session on making hybrid work for you as a leader. And you'll see a poll below where you will be able to vote on it. So please go ahead and vote in this poll right now on whether you would like to receive those resources or not. Please go ahead, give you 30 seconds or so on to vote in the poll, make that decision. See that about two thirds of you voted. Let's see if any more of you will vote. Make your voice heard. Give you 10 more seconds. Three, two, one. Okay, closing out the poll. Thank you all.
Well, great. With that, Doctor. Yeah, with that, Doctor Glenn, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it back um, and summarize where we uh, what we wanted to talk about today, which is these big decisions. And I'd like to thank Doctor Glenn. I mean, your content is great. Again, I encourage people to download that report. Uh, also, let you know uh, that as you know that this the, this deck and this presentation will be available as well as a recorded version of this webinar. But we really wanted to focus on these big decisions that people are facing, that our leaders are facing, is how to compete on these new battlefields. And we identified the ways where this has changed and how it's changed from the talent wars of 2019. And these two big decisions that no one's ever had to make before. I mean, you're really working without a net on this in terms of how to return to work and how to hybrid. And hopefully some of the ideas, the data, the suggestions, and the expert perspective that Dr. Gleb provided uh, will help you make those decisions and make them in ways that will truly benefit your business and give you the ability to ride this economic wave that we're going to see this year into next year and beyond as we're at the start of the next great growth cycle. And before we take questions, I'd like to leave you with this uh, from Peter Drucker, uh, who said, whenever you see a successful business, someone once made a courageous decision. And I would suggest that each of you are facing a series of courageous decisions and they're facing you right here, right now. And you'll know right away uh, what the right answer is. And I can tell you this, that I don't know what the right answer is, but I do know that every wrong answer will be punished. And we're here to help you with that uh, through our research, through our data, and the expert perspectives that we have. So again, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. I'd like to thank Dr. Gleb uh, for being with us today. Uh, and Anne, I'm going to turn it back to you to process any questions uh, that we might have had. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Joe. So um just going back to some of the things that we already talked about. And one of the early charts you shared, Joe, is the, the idea about the job and company growth as a key area that candidates are actually looking at. So as a small business, how might someone address a question they might get from prospects that they're worried about joining you since you are a small company? So even though the, some of our um, small and mid-sized businesses might've been around for 20 years, they might still get that question from millennials. So I want to talk I about think, how can small businesses uh, overcome that challenge? I think it really is incumbent on, on the CEO and those people recruiting to be able to have a story of how the company was functioning leading into the pandemic, what you did, uh, both in terms of for your customers and for your employees, uh, and how that resulted in your business's health going forward. Uh, we tracked the data all throughout the, the pandemic and saw a steady progression of people moving from uh, revenues down to revenues up. And some folks are still hurting, uh, but clearly employees, prospective employees want to be part of a healthy growing company and uh, CEOs and hiring managers need to create a winning story that tells that. Because if you don't have that story to tell, it's not an attractive situation, especially when uh, prospective employees have so many options to choose from. Exactly. And I think that sometimes small businesses might have some of that flexibility that uh, candidates are actually looking at. So that could be definitely part of the story. Uh, another area for competition we talked about is benefits. We talked about compensation, but as an executive search consultant, um, prior to the pandemic, PTO was a big deal, personal time off and unlimited PTO or offering a lot. Do you think, um, Dr. Gleb, that the hybrid work schedule, like being able to be more flexible will indirectly address that ask for more PTO? There's no question that it will. So when we're looking at the hybrid schedule flexibility and the questions are about employee benefits, you meant, I mentioned those eight surveys. One of the fundamental questions on several of those surveys was about employee perceptions of benefits. The biggest benefit was healthcare, but unlike previous surveys, and that's like similar to previous surveys, unlike previous surveys, the second biggest benefit was flexibility. Not PTO, nothing like that, but flexibility, meaning ability to work remotely, meaning ability to have hybrid. So people wanted that flexibility. And that I think is the underpinning of PTO. And here, the new flexibility. Flexibility is the new black, as Joe said. And flexibility right now will be that ability to work hybrid slash remote. So if you want, whether you're a small business or a medium sized business, if you wanna compete with the big boys like Amazon, Google and Apple, which are not being very flexible, you want to make sure that you are offering your employees flexibility and that you're using best practices on how they can work most effectively in a hybrid schedule that will definitely be attractive for them. 
Yeah, and I think you'll see that shift as well in this in this environment that Dr. Glover responds to. The notion of PTO is the notion of I'm not in the office. It's the binary on off. In the hybrid model where things tend to blur a little bit, uh, I would take PTO when I'm going with my family for a week to the beach because you are going to be checked out. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the ability to move in and move out and, and, and be flexible and nimble with that, I think that's going to see that notion of, of the on-off binary nature of PTO uh, cease to be as critical as it was when, well, you're not in the office, therefore you must be off versus, you know what, I'm not around this afternoon because, 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 but I'll be back online this evening. Uh, and I think that's part of what, what Dr. Love, you had said when you talk about performance uh, is that measure me on performance, not on attendance. You're absolutely right, Joe. And this will be the key thing. I mean, does it really matter how much time someone takes off in PTO if they're still delivering everything that they need to be delivering? That is you what know, you really want to be focusing on, their deliverables, what they're accomplishing. That is the you know, underlying basis. And I can guarantee to you, many, many employees will be very much attracted to a performance-based evaluation that's informed by deliverables, by their accomplishments, not their time spent working. Well, I'd love to get your opinion on this. This I saw this this week that said the optimal workday is five hours. Now we're caught up in the industrial age boomer mentality of you check in at nine and you check out at five and attendance matters. But this study looked at productivity and performance and the optimal workday is about five hours. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's definitely the case that the optimal workday when you're actually looking at how people spend their time, the amount of time working, five hours is great. If you are, you know, for, for the Monday to Friday schedule, when somebody's coming in nine to five, how long do you think they're actually working? <laughs> As opposed to, you know, go taking a break or, you know, checking their smartphone or whatever they're doing. They're, if, you, if they're working five hours, you're lucky. <laughs> Let's be honest about that. If they're working productively, creatively five hours. So if people are given the flexibility to choose how to work those five hours, when to work those five hours, they can fit that around their schedules. And most importantly, they can fit it to their energy levels, which different people have different energy levels that fluctuate throughout the day rather than that Monday for Friday, nine to five schedule. And if you measure them on accomplishments, it really doesn't matter how much time they work as long as they are there for the collaborative tasks, of course. We talked about that and that kind of the collaborative digital co-working. If you measure them on deliverables, if you mention the, them on their accomplishments, that's what matters. That's what you should care about. So you make sure that you measure them on their accomplishments and their deliverables and let them decide what they do, how they do their individual tasks. Not talking about their collaborative tasks, but how they do their individual tasks. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be a hard concept for some of our old school uh, <laughs> leaders uh, who come from that environment and background. But it's the concept of, you know, uh, pay me for what I do, not how long it takes me or when I choose to do it. Yeah, well, our new environment that the future is increasingly disrupted. The old model, the industrial age model is not the model of the future. And I think yeah. Vistage members are Vistage members because they know that their previous intuitions and expectations are not necessarily a good fit for the future. And they want to be informed. They want to evolve. They want to succeed. And that's why they're here. We've described it as a new reality, meaning it's not a new normal or the next normal because there'll be nothing normal about it. <laughs> Uh, this behavior change, this, you know, you think about disruptions, the industrial age took 70 years, uh, technology 40, but really the internet about 15 years of change. We saw this accelerated disruption in 15 months. Yeah. And now we come out of it and we're in this, this new reality uh, where so many things are different and so many things are, are changing. And those of us that are able to adapt, we know that Darwin taught us, it's not the strong that survive, it's those that are most able to adapt that will survive. And I think those that can adapt to this are the ones that will thrive. And as I said before, uh, every bad decision is gonna get punished and it's gonna get punished with turnover and retention issues. As Amazon, Apple and Google have seen. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights, Dr. Gleb and Joe. We will be sending out a link to the recording and the slides within 24 hours. And Dr. Gleb will be following up with those who opted into his resources. So for members of our Vistage community, if you haven't done so already, please make sure to save the date for an exclusive interview with General Colin Powell that will be released on July 16th. Very excited to learn some leadership lessons from his storied career. So thank you everyone for your time as part of our Peak Performer webinar series. Take care and be safe, everyone. Thanks, everyone.